Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Chad with Patriot Astro, and I want to get back into Nina and the 1.11 Advanced Sequencer. Now, I've already done several videos on this topic, but I want to jump in now and share some of the sequences that I use. I want to go through each sequence, I want to explain what's happening within each sequence, and then I'm going to share the exports of these sequences on my website. Follow along until the end, get a good feel for the sequences I'm using and about to share, and then go ahead and download them. All right, so here we are in Nina. You can see I'm in nightly 147 of version 1.11. And that is critical because that's what we need for the advanced sequencer, right? Version 1.11. So here under sequencer, I could click add new target. Now this is gonna bring me to the basic sequencer. I do not wanna be here. This is what you're familiar with if you haven't used the nightly edition. You can still use the basic sequencer. Now what we wanna do though, is we wanna go into the advanced sequencer. And this is where we have things that people believe are a little bit more complicated. Again, watch my videos. So you have a lot of instructions and you also have the ability to have a number of templates here, including some base templates and some other things. And yours may look a little bit different. What I'm gonna do is go ahead and show you how to import templates to this location. First, you need to download the templates that I've made available. And to do that, we're gonna go back into Chrome and we're gonna to go to my webpage. So this is patriotastro.com. Once you're at my Patriot Astro page, certainly feel free to jump around and look at some different things here, look at some of my image archives. But what you want to do is go to Learn More and then go to Nina Advanced Sequence Downloads. Once you're on this page, uh, there is a download link here where you can download the zip file with the five sequences. These are descriptions of the five sequences that are available to you right now. Um, I may modify these over time. I may uh, increase the number that are here based on feedback I get from everyone. But there's basically a simple uh, mono LRGB sequence. There's a mono LRGB that uses filter offsets. There's one for narrowband, for mono, for show imaging. There's also a mono show offsets if you're using filter offsets. And then I have a very basic sequence for one shot color. Now, I do have a series of videos on my YouTube channel. And if you go to my YouTube channel, you can find the information here um, uh, through the various playlists. There's some Nina playlists and some other things here, but I do have some really good uh, videos on filter offsets, on using the advanced sequencer, um, on building uh, smarter sequences. So definitely poke around and take a look and let me know if you have any questions. So let's go back here to my webpage and we're gonna go ahead and download this. And by clicking this zip, it'll just download to your downloads folder. And then I'm gonna go ahead and click on it and it'll open it up and it's in my downloads folder. And I'm gonna go ahead and extract this and I'm just gonna extract it into my downloads folder for now. And I can see now they're in place, right? So I've got everything that I described on my web page. So let's come back into Nina in the advanced sequencer. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna load a completed sequence from a JSON file. So now I wanna go back into downloads, find the files we just extracted, and I'm gonna go ahead and you can open one of these at a time. So I'm gonna start at the top and open it. Now, once this is open here, what I'm gonna have you do is immediately save it. So way up top here, we'll see it says mono LRGB. I'm gonna go ahead and click the save icon. Notice it saved it off here to the right. It is now reusable. I'm gonna immediately delete this. Then I'm gonna come back in and I'm gonna open my second one. I'm gonna let it open. I'm going to save it and now we have mono LRGB offsets and I'm going to delete it and I'm going to do this until I have all five loaded. So now you can see that I actually have all five of these loaded here and they're ready to use. So a couple things about this. Now I can simply drag and drop them and build a sequence from the ground up entering data. I can also, if I go into the sky atlas, I can just do a search here. I can find any object in the Sky Atlas I wish to image. And as an example, I can say add target to sequence and notice if I click sequencer, see everything's already here. I can go ahead and add it dynamically here. Or I can say, let's set it for framing. I can look at some framing here and I can say, well, I wanna add this to a sequence. I wanna use the sequencer. And then I can say, well, I wanna shoot this one in mono show with offsets. And by clicking here, notice it'll load this up 
in mono show for offsets, ready to go. So let's jump back out of here and I'm gonna get into the sequencer itself. So let's go ahead and look. And we're gonna start with a simple um, one-shot color. So I'm gonna drag this over here and we're just gonna go through how the one-shot color is structured. Now, there may be some things you choose to get rid of from here. There may be some things that you choose to add based on your own needs. Now, my assumption here is in the OSC in the one-shot color is that you're gonna have a target that you're gonna pull from somewhere, probably framing. And then we've got all of these commands. And let's kind of go through what I'm doing here. So a couple things. So what we have here are triggers, and triggers are going to be evaluated uh, between instructions uh, to see if something special needs to happen. So certainly a meridian flip, right? The meridian flip for this particular object at all zeros is right here, right? So if I click, it's at about 148 um, AM. So we can see we've got a meridian flip that uh, once we cross the meridian based on our meridian flip parameters, in our options and configuration, we will perform a meridian flip. I have center after drift and restore guiding. Some of you may not have used this before. Now, what center after drift does is it says that in this case, the way I've defined it is every six exposures, it's going to do a background plate solve. So after every six pictures, it's going to do a background plate solve. And if the center of my target, based on this definition, has moved by a uh, a maximum of three arc minutes, and it's done some calculations here based on my configuration and my devices, right? My, my uh, camera, et cetera. So if this has drifted too far off course, right? So I'm starting to lose my centering. What it's going to do is it's gonna recenter me. It's going to go ahead and that plate solve is gonna force a recenter. Now it's important that you leave this enough room so that things like dithering, where you are moving off center, um, doesn't cause you to uh, trigger a center after drift. We want dithering to occur. So you want it to be enough drift normally, but not so much that you're off target. The reason we use this is, let's say you get clouds in the middle of the night during your sequence. Well, if you have clouds in the middle of the night in your sequence, you may run into an issue where uh, your particular mount um, just doesn't track well and you're drifting so much that by the time the clouds go away, the second half of your evening, all of the images are framed completely wrong. You've got maybe half of your target on screen. So what this does is fixes that problem, right? It allows you to have some clouds come through. It allows you to drift off course. Now, the reality is if you've got a good mount, a good polar alignment, you may never trigger this. But uh, from my perspective, why not put it here, right? Let's say an animal outside bumps your rig or you get a temporary cable snag that throws you off, center after drift will reanalyze your centering every six uh, exposures and potentially bring you back and save the rest of your evening. Now, restore guiding should be used in conjunction with this. If guiding ever fails, restore guiding will bring it back. So it's just a best practice here. If you use center after drift, use restore guiding and restore guiding can do other things as well. Okay, now I don't have a loop here in this outer portion, so we're going to go right into some instructions. This is sort of my beginning of evening or beginning of target instructions. So wait for time. Basically, I'm going to wait for nautical dusk. You have multiple options here, a specific time, sunset, etc. So if we look at the timing here at the top of the screen, this is daytime. This is sunset, this line here. This is nautical dusk. This is astronomical dusk. This is nighttime, and then we have astronomical dawn, nautical dawn, sunrise. Now, what I have found myself is that I can actually do some imaging uh, pretty well, especially if I'm imaging away from either sunrise or sunset, um, starting with nautical dusk. So I can start here nautically instead of waiting for astronomical. Feel free to modify this to your own needs, but I'm going to go ahead and use nautical dusk. I'm also going to say that, hey, not only do we have to wait for it to get dark enough, but we're also going to wait until we are above the horizon. And I don't have a horizon line loaded right now, but in my other videos, you can look at my horizon line video. And I usually have a horizon line and I'm going to wait for us to hit that horizon as well. So again, this is just me waiting to make sure the target is high enough in the sky and beyond my obstructions and that it's dark enough in the evening. Once those two conditions, right, because these go in order, once these two conditions are satisfied, 
We're going to unpark the scope. And I'm going to force tracking. So I'm going to basically force that we're going to use um, uh, the, the appropriate tracking rate. Now I do this because uh, I just want to make sure that if I'm unattended at this point and for some reason I'd left it on solar or lunar or something happened or it stopped, I want to force it to make sure I'm tracking appropriately. This may be unnecessary for you, but again, it's just another way for me to make sure that I don't miss something. I'm going to go ahead and cool my camera, in this case to negative 10 degrees Celsius. Now, here's something that you may find interesting. I'm going to go ahead and force a slew to a specific altitude in azimuth. I'm going to force it to 70 degrees uh, high in altitude and 90 degrees in azimuth, which is to my east. So the question is, well, why am I forcing this? That's not what I'm imaging. I'm forcing this because I'm about to do an autofocus and I know that's unobstructed. If for some reason something's wrong with my horizon and when I go ahead and just slew to the target in question, it's possible that I slew somewhere um, where maybe I don't have good visibility. Maybe I'm still kind of right on the edge of the horizon that I've defined and I've, I've only got half of an image and it's possible autofocus could fail. A lot of other things could happen. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually force myself to a point in my sky where I know there are no obstructions, right? I'm going to point east at 70 degrees high. Then I'm going to go ahead and run my autofocus. The other reason I'm going east is because I'm going away from sunset. So I know I'm at nautical uh, dusk and I know the sun sets to the west. So I'm going to point in the easterly direction and go ahead and make sure that I'm good to go with an autofocus. I'm also going to assume the mount is going to assume it's pointing in the right place, but it could be slightly off. So after my autofocus completes, I'm actually going to do a solve and sync. So I'm going to take a picture of the sky now that I'm in focus and I'm going to sync the coordinates to exactly where I'm pointing to my mount. So now my mount knows where I am because I've solved that location synced after my autofocus. Now I'm going to slew in center. Now that the mount knows exactly where I'm pointing, I'm going to go ahead and slew to these coordinates and center the target via plate solving. Once I'm on target, I'm going to go ahead and start guiding and I'm not going to force calibration. All right, now we get to the imaging, right? I'm guiding and I'm on target. I'm focused. I'm ready to go. Now for one shot color imaging, I'm going to do a couple things. I've got a couple triggers here in this container. I'm going to autofocus after an HFR increase. And again, you can test these uh, settings out, but I'm going to say if I have a sample size of six images, every six images, I'm going to check for a uh, 5% change in HFR. If I have a 5% change in HFR, um, I'm going to go ahead and force an autofocus on that one shot color camera. I'm also going to dither every five exposures in this particular case. Again, this is all things you can modify. Now, my looping conditions say continue until either one of these, uh, continue imaging until either one of these conditions fail. And notice I have two here. So I have loop while altitude above horizon. So that's my horizon line again. So I could actually say if I hit the horizon line, meaning I can't image anymore, go ahead and stop and drop out of this and be done or I can loop until a specific time. Now I leave this as time by default because if I choose to drop a second target behind this, um, uh, so that I'm gonna do multi-target, I may wanna set this as a specific time in the evening that I say, okay, do this until 2 a.m. Uh, you know, and then at 2 a.m. go ahead and go on to the next target. If I'm only doing a single target, I'll just simply go here and say, you know what, let's do it till nautical dawn and I'm good to go. So now I've got my conditions and triggers. All I'm going to do is have a single instruction. I'm going to take a 120 second exposure. It's a light frame. I'm going to use all the built-in parameters and that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to do a two minute exposure. Uh, but because it's within this loop, it's going to continue to take two minute exposures until either of these looping conditions uh, are met. And then, of course, throughout the evening, again, we're going to dither and autofocus as necessary. Now, once we drop out of this particular container, because we've met a looping condition endpoint, we're going to stop guiding. So that's the end of it, right? Now, one thing I will mention here is that notice I don't have anything in my sequence end. So what I do here is add some end of sequence instructions. And all I'm going to do at the end of my sequence is warm the camera and park the scope. And that's the end of the night, right? In the morning, I'll go and gather up all my equipment. And again, this is something extra you would add uh, to the bottom of the sequence that we just imported. So that was one shot color. Now we're going to be able to go through the other ones much more quickly because uh, we are able to um, uh, benefit from everything we just learned. They're all going to be very similar. 
So let's go ahead and delete this here. Now let's, we've done one shot color. Let's go to mono LRGB. So in this particular sequence, looks pretty much the same at the top. Um, again, manipulate this as necessary for your uh, center after drift um, and what you find is necessary here. Uh, we're gonna wait for a certain time. We're gonna wait until above horizon, unpark, set the tracking cool the camera. Now notice here, because this is a mono camera with filters, I am going to switch the filter. So I'm going to go ahead and force my system to make sure I'm on the luminance filter. I'm going to slew to the part of the sky where I do my autofocus. I'm going to solve and sync, slow and center, and start guiding. So just like one shot color. Then when I get into my major uh, part of the sequence where I'm doing my imaging, same thing. I'm going to autofocus after HFR and autofocus after filter change in this case. I'm going to loop as necessary to my horizon or a time, so maybe until nautical dawn. And then this is a little bit more complicated in that I have to take pictures of various, um, uh, with various filters. So I've got smart exposures. Basically, I'm going to do six 120 second images of my blue filter. I'm going to do six 120 seconds of green, then luminance, and then red. Then, at the end of this, I'm going to dither. Now, if you didn't watch my other video on smarter sequences, the reason I do this is because um, rather than just dithering every so many, I'm going to loop through this and then come back around. Now, between each of these smart exposures, I am going to do an autofocus. So, depending on how frequently you want to autofocus, here I'm doing it about every 15 minutes, maybe aggressive. You can change these numbers and make these six explosions 10 or 15 or 20 or whatever you're comfortable with. I'm trying to get a good distribution of images throughout the evening. Now, why do I dither at the end instead of in between or just every so many uh, images? Well, the reason I'm doing this is to limit the amount of dithering time that I lose to imaging um, in the evening. So what happens here, if you think about it, is I'm going to take six blue images then six green, six luminance, six red, all in the same position. Then I'm going to dither. And then when I come back around in the loop, I'm gonna take six more blue, but in a new dithered location. Six green, six luminance, six red, all in a new dithered location. Then I dither and move. Now, the reason that's interesting is because um, if I go back and just look at all my blue frames at the end of the night, I'm gonna have dithered every six blue frames. I'm gonna have dithered every six green frames, every six luminance, every six red. But rather than just doing it over and over and over in between um, all of my uh, imaging, I can actually do a batch of each filter, then dither, and then come back around. So again, I've got some of the math to this in a previous uh, video. Feel free to go to go look at that um, as well. Now, the next question you may have is, why am I going BGLR? I thought this was an LRGB sequence. Well. So I have calculated offsets, and even if you're not going to use offsets, I recommend that you calculate your offsets, and you can watch a previous video on that as well. And the reason is because if I actually go back here into options, into autofocus, these are my filter offsets that were calculated. And notice the positions. And if you watch my previous video, you'll know that because I'm using autofocus configuration that includes backlash, Every time I change direction, I'm going to have to do this backlash thing, right? It's going to reverse the direction of my autofocuser and then uh, it, it, to correct for that backlash. Well, if I can keep my focuser moving in a single direction, I don't run into that problem. So if I look at LRGB, I've got zero as a position on my uh, focuser, negative 12, 11, and 41. So I'm going to start with B, the highest number, 41. Then I'm going to go to G then L is zero, and then I go negative. So B, G, L, R keeps my focuser moving in a consistent direction, which keeps my gears engaged, which means I do not have to lose any time or have any issues as a result of continuing to put an autofocus um, backlash uh, calculation into the mix. So again, I've got B, G, L, R if I'm moving from high numbers to low numbers on the number line. So BGLR, if I go back to my sequence, notice it's B, G, L, and R. And again, that's just about trying to say, hey, how do I keep this clean? How do I keep the teeth engaged? How do I keep autofocus working? Even though I'm not using offsets, I use my offset calculations that told me where my filters need to uh, fall on that number line to do this. And again, go watch my offset filter uh, video on this. And then again, at the end of the night, this will just end and stop guiding. Now, 
very, very quickly, we can look at the um, mono show. So it'll be very similar to LRGB. It looks almost identical, right? Same triggers, same conditions. Um, I am going to use my luminance filter even for SHO because um, that's uh, going to be a little bit easier to focus, a little faster to focus than like an HA filter where I need a lot more exposure time. So I can do a quick filter change, do a basic autofocus. When I get down here, again, it's mostly the same. I'll set my loop time to something like Nautical Dawn again. Um, but notice here I'm just doing SHO, but I did it in the order of OHS. So if I come back here again, why did I do OHS? If I look at SHO, on the number line, they all go negative um, because they're all in relation to my luminance. But O is negative 87, HA is negative 102, and then even further left on the number line is negative 212S. So I'm going to go OHS to keep my teeth engaged, just like I did with LRGB. So back in the sequencer, that's why I'm going OHS. Notice I am dithering every single frame because I'm doing five minute frames. And again, in this particular case, I'm going to autofocus after every filter change. So I've got it defined as every uh, six uh, images with a filter. So I've got six 300 second images dithering every one. And then I'll have a filter change based on the trigger. And then again, I'll move on to uh, hydrogen alpha, then sulfur. And I'll just keep looping until my conditions meet. And then I'll autofocus as necessary, both on filter change or if there's an HFR increase. So very, very similar to LRGB. Uh, the only things I've tweaked here is because I'm doing much longer times. Um, I do want to dither, you know, a little bit more frequently. Um, so just something to consider there. So let's go ahead and get rid of this one. Now let's go to the offset versions. And again, I've covered some of this in previous videos, but because I'm using filter offsets, I don't have to worry about autofocus between filter changes. I know my calculations when I move from red to luminance or green to HA as an example. I know exactly what I need to move on my autofocuser. And if you don't understand this again, go watch the autofocus um, and offset videos that I have. But again, it, it's very similar. So we're going to go ahead and go through everything we did before. Um, I'm going to go ahead and step through. Um, I don't need, because I'm using offsets, if you are using offsets, you'll notice that you have used filter offsets enabled. And with filter offsets enabled, you have an autofocus filter defined. In this case, it's luminance. Because my autofocus uh, filter is defined, my sequence doesn't need to go ahead and set the uh, filter to luminance like I did in the previous ones, right? It's automatically, when I run an autofocus, it knows to go ahead and do it in luminance because that's how I've defined my configuration. So once I get into the bulk of the imaging here, uh, go back and watch my Smarter Sequences video. Basically, that's what I have here for a deeper description. But fundamentally, again, I'm only going to autofocus on HFR increases. I'm going to loop uh, until some time. Maybe Nautical Dawn is what I'd set it to, depending on what I'm imaging that evening. And then in this case, I'm going to do some number of, um, of frames. And in this case, because it's LRGB, I'm going to do three minute or two minute frames. I'm going to do three two minute blue, green, Luminance and red, remember the order is based on the offsets. And then after I get through those, I'm going to run a parallel instruction set where I switch the filter. So I'm preparing myself for my next frame. So I'm setting the blue filter so I'm ready to go. And while, because this is in parallel, while I'm moving to the blue filter, I'm going to go ahead and dither simultaneously. That way, by the time we're ready to take a picture, the dither's done, and I'm already on my blue filter, ready to go. Now, this is going to keep looping through using those filter offset calculations, and will only autofocus based on an uh, HFR increase. Um, again, go back and watch my offset videos and smarter sequence videos to get an understanding of this if this is confusing. Same thing here. Mono show offsets. Basically, it is mono camera, SHO imaging, so same type of concept here, except I'm doing it with a uh, narrow band. So I've got three minute, uh, or I'm sorry, five minute subs, 300 second subs. I do one of each, OHS. And then I go ahead and parallel dither while I'm setting my filter back to O3. And then by the time the dither's completed, filter's already in position, we can just start imaging again. And we'll just loop this through until these conditions are met. And again, it could be nautical dawn. So the last thing that I will show you here is let's just go look at how this uh, works. If I go into the Sky Atlas, let's say we want to find something we can shoot at the beginning of the evening. So let's go LBN uh, 191 here. So I'm going to set this for framing. 
I'm going to go ahead and add that to the sequence. Certainly, we could change the framing and recenter it. I'm going to say, yep, that's fine. Manipulate it as necessary. I'm going to add this to the sequence. And in this case, I'm just going to say mono SHL. I'm not going to use offsets. So notice that that will load here, and it adds the necessary data, and it loaded my mono SHO configuration. So let's say I want to do something else, right? I have a second target that I want to load that evening. And let's say at the end of the night, I'd like to look at a galaxy. So let's find a galaxy that's available at the end of the night. And let's say it's M33. So let's set it for framing. And because it's a galaxy, in this particular case, I'm going to shoot it in LRGB. And again, I won't use offsets just for the purpose of this example. So once it comes up here in framing, we'll be able to uh, add the target to the sequence. And in this case, I'm going to go to my sequencer and I'm going to say mono LRGB. So my first target, if I expand it, um, I'm going to start it nautical dust or my uh, offset, right? That's fine. Both of those conditions have to be met. It's going to do everything we talked about from an imaging perspective. But when do I want this one to end? Well, let's say we want it to end maybe at 1 a.m. So I'm going to shoot this target until 1 a.m. in the morning. And now after this expires, either we're below our horizon or we hit 1 a.m., this condition will be met, which will mean we'll drop out of this particular target. Once we drop out of that target, we're going to move right on to the next one. Now, if I look at my second target, what are its starting conditions? Well, it's got to be at least nautical dusk and above the horizon, right? So both of those conditions obviously will be met by 1 a.m. That's fine. So we'll just immediately check all of the status of everything. Uh, possibly go ahead and do our uh, uh, autofocus again, solve and sync, etc. Because this is my second target, I may want to get rid of some of these things, right? I know I'm already imaging. There's really no reason for me to unpark the scope. I know I'm tracking. I know my camera is cooling. Uh, again, all of this is okay. I may want to autofocus, so maybe I'll leave that in place just to run another autofocus before I get going. Um, I can go ahead and slew and center this target, start guiding. So again, because it's a secondary target, I may choose to remove some of that. Now, if I didn't, it may consume some time, but it's not going to break anything, right? So I could have left that the way it was. Now, again, I'm going to do my imaging here at the second half of the evening, and I'm doing LRGB imaging. And when do I want to end? I'll set that condition here as maybe nautical, uh, nautical dawn. So now I've got filamentary nebula. We'll go until 1 a.m. Then we'll move on to triangulum pinwheel and we'll capture that in LRGB until nautical dawn. And again, I can also end the sequence and it just may be a best practice for you to do some sort of ending, um, night ending sequence here where I warm the camera and park the scope. And that's it, right? So I've got multiple options. There's a lot of things I can do here. Um, hopefully, you find that this gives you a good head start and, and allows you to uh, import my sequences and start using them and modifying them as necessary. Let's talk briefly, very, very briefly, about modifying sequences in case you choose to do that. Let's say you're using my Mono SHO and you've decided that you don't have a horizon line and don't care about that you don't care about this tracking command, and you don't care uh, to maybe do uh, center after drift for whatever reason. So let's just say you've modified this in some way, maybe even changed the number of oxygen, right, that, that you want to capture, right, the amount of oxygen you want to capture. So that's fine. So all you need to do is come up here, and you can even rename this if necessary. So I can come up here and say mono show test, and then just once it's modified and I've changed the name, go ahead and click save. It's going to save it, and notice it's here. So the next time I load, mono show test or pit choose it from somewhere else in the uh, Nina interface, it will load up. And again, notice the changes uh, were saved as well. So I'm capturing 10 instead of six, oxygen three, and I've gotten rid of this, the things I needed. And let's say I want to go a little bit further. Let's say, well, I meant that actually to be 10 of each. And I go ahead and do 10 of each. And now I want to save this. I don't have to rename it. I can actually simply just go save. It'll say it already exists. You want to overwrite. I say OK. And it just go ahead and saves it. And just to verify that, notice now when it loads, it is saved appropriately. Well, hopefully you found that helpful. I do suggest you get into Nina's 1.11 Advanced Sequencer if you are not yet. The capabilities are amazing. And they're only getting better. 
As always, like and subscribe, share these videos with your friends, ask any questions you may have, and follow along with our journey, and let's make it our journey instead of just my journey. And of course, as always, clear skies.